Hi, this is Randall Schwartz, host of Floss Weekly. This week, Gareth Greenaway joins me. We're going to be talking about putting APIs in all those legacy databases. You're not going to want to miss this, so stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Floss Weekly is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Floss Weekly with Randall Schwartz and Gareth Greenaway. Episode 391 recorded June 7th, 2016. Dream Factory. This episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by IT Pro TV. IT Pro TV is an easy, entertaining approach to online IT training. For a free seven day trial and 30% off the life of your account, go to itpro.tv slash floss and use the code floss30. And by DigitalOcean, simple and fast cloud hosting built for developers. Deploy an SSD cloud server in 55 seconds. Try it today for free. Visit digitalocean.com, and once you sign up, be sure to enter the promo code FLOSS in the billing section to get your $10 credit. It's time for Floss Weekly, the show about free Libre open source software. I am your host, Randall Schwartz, Merlin at StoneEngine.com, bringing you each week the movers, the shakers, the big projects, the little projects, projects you may be wanting to download right after this show and play with, projects you may be using every day and not aware of it. This uh, Today's show is probably both of those last items, so that's sort of interesting. Uh, joining me today, uh, luckily stepping forward at the last minute, Gareth Greenaway. Welcome back to the show. Thanks, Randall. Thanks for having me back. Always glad to be cool. here. Cool, cool, cool. And I suspect you're in your Thousand Oaks secret bunker? I am, yes. 20 feet underground. Cool. All right, and that's where that sunlight's coming from. I mean, that it's artificial. It's a really good artificial light. And I am just south of you. I am once again in Santa Monica on the 11th floor of ZipRecruiter, and behind me is the ocean, which you could see if it wasn't a June gloom day where we could just get this this marine layer that goes over everything. Uh, yesterday's burnt off at about 1 p.m., so I'm hoping I will get to see blue, but we don't get to see blue at the beginning of the show. Um, and also for you to watch and those of you watching the video and had seen the video the last couple of weeks, uh, my uh, unfortunate black eye is pretty much cleared up, and I'm very happy about that. So I won't mention it anymore, but uh, it took a while to heal up, and uh, luckily no pain while that was going on. Uh, just some pain while I was getting it. <laughs> that was a mess. But enough about those stories. As it's enough about uh, this week in geography. Today, we have a pretty fascinating uh, show. It's, we uh, made contact with uh, Dream Factory at OSCON. And they've put everything together. In fact, uh, a little behind the scenes, um, uh, my guest that was supposed to be on today canceled on me last Thursday. So I've been scrambling to try to fill the slot. And just yesterday, as I sort of had given up all hope, uh, Bill Appleton, who's going to be joining us in a few moments to talk about Dream Factory, came forward and we ran, we scrambled to get the whole show put together. So thank you. Uh, well, Bill's not here yet. I didn't invite him in yet. <laughs> so anyway, we will definitely thank him when we bring him on. Um, so what Dream Factory is, uh, is a, a really remarkable project from what I can tell. It seems like it has a huge amount of potential and is already being used by some rather major clients. Um, and it's a way of building uh, APIs rather rapidly on top of your existing file storage, your your SQL storage or no SQL storage, and then use that. Uh, it has a lot of really interesting features in it as well, like things really, things that are sort of advanced, like rate limiting and stuff. So we'll be sure to talk about all that as we get into the show. Um, I know you've only had like, what, about three hours to <laughs> review any material, Gareth? What, what, what's your takeaway from this? Yeah, no, exactly what you said. Um, it looks like um, if you have uh, an existing database or, or existing um, file structure and you want to rapidly make that accessible to people um it, it seems like dream factory is is accomplishing that goal yeah it's like i know here at ZipRecruiter, uh, they're having an interesting situation where they they built a lot of their internal you know things as a web service and uh, not a web service but as a as, as a, a normal application server and now when they decided to go mobile they had to like rewrite a whole bunch of stuff as apis and that means going in and adding a lot more code and they're doing it all by hand so we've actually got a couple of guys here at work interested in this show already so they'll be either watching it right now or they'll watch it when we uh, when we get done here and it goes on the cdns uh similarly um i have uh, my my other client my cruise client uh for insight cruises we have uh, essentially a web application that that I've been developing over the last 10 years. But now we want to implement some security because right now the, the uh, uh, 
the, don't tell the PCI guys, but the front end actually does have access to the database. And we're just sort of hoping nobody, uh, see, this is like the third week in a row I've revealed something secret that I don't want people to know. And I say, what the hell? It's only, it's only some number of thousands of people who are going to hear this. Anyway, so, so what we want to do is a couple of things. I want to actually uh, uh, Ajaxify the front end uh, booking engine, uh, which lets customers uh, actually put themselves on a cruise ship. And uh, I, I, that means I need to develop APIs for that. Um, and that's going to be tricky. So I'm, uh, my, my client there and I are both looking at this and looking at its potential. At least we won't have been able to glean from going through the docks for a couple of hours. And uh, so I may actually have two clients using this stuff really shortly. It kind of depends on what kind of takeaway I can get from this show. So I am looking forward to that. But before we bring on Bill Appleton to talk about this wonderful, fascinating project, uh, I have a little bit of business to do. So a good IT pro is constantly constantly learning and staying up to date with current technology certifications. IT Pro TV's high quality video tutorials will not only keep your IT skills current, but they will bring you closer to achieving that new IT job you've been working towards. They've got a thousand hours of content and more than 30 hours of new course content added every week. You can stream their courses live and on demand and worldwide to your Chromecast, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Apple TV, or PC. Plus, learn on the go with your mobile device. IT Pro TV is now the first IT video provider with courses for sale through Amazon Video Direct. While subscriptions are still the best value, we're excited to see IT Pro TV's content available for purchase on Amazon. IT Pro TV's course topics include PF Sense. Citrix Zen Server, A+, AWS, Ethical Hacking, CompTIA Advanced Security Practitioner, Microsoft Server 2016 MCSE, and more. They also recently completed the CISA, a globally recognized certification in the field of audit, control, and security of information systems with Cybex author Brian O'Hara. And June courses include CCNA Security, that's from Cisco, VCP6, that's VMware, and Adam Gordon returns for CEH V9. There's 100 plus step-by-step -step virtual machine labs and transcender practice exams, that's $109 value. One low monthly subscription price, no hassle cancellation policy. If you're currently signed up for an enterprise account with an IT Pro TV competitor and subject to rate increases, IT Pro TV will match previous year's pricing of that account so you and your team can learn at an affordable rate. IT Pro TV's clients include Harvard, MIT, UCSD, Stanford, and more. So check out itpro.tv slash floss and upgrade your brain with the most popular IT certifications. Premium subscriptions are normally $57 a month or $570 per year, but we have a special offer. Try it free for seven days when you sign up using our code FLOSS30 to check out their courses live stream, and more. You'll also receive 30% off the lifetime of your account. That's less than $40 per month or $399 for the entire year. Just visit itpro.tv slash F-L-O-S-S. -S. Use the code FLOSS30 and try it free for seven days, plus save 30% off the life of your account. We thank IT Pro TV for their support of Floss Weekly. And let's go ahead and bring our guest on, Bill Appleton. Welcome to the show. Hi, Randall. Glad to meet you. Great, great. Um, and uh, where are you speaking to us from? I'm here in our Campbell office, uh, just south of, uh, you know, San Francisco. Okay, cool, cool. And uh, what's the weather like there? Uh, it's going to be a nice day. Cool. Awesome. Awesome. Okay, enough of that. Uh, I gave what I thought this was about. I, I Hopefully I got it pretty close. That can also tell you how good your elevator pitches are. But why don't you give us a 30,000 foot view? What is... Uh, uh, Dream uh, Factory, I'm going to get that right at least twice. Uh, and and what problem is it trying to solve? Yeah, so Dream Factory is a runtime stack. So you can install it almost anywhere. It's just a LAMP stack. And it connects any data source to any device with RESTful services. So if you have a, a SQL database, NoSQL, file storage, legacy SOAP services, or um, any other RESTful service, you can connect it to Dream Factory. And it makes it into a platform approach for mobile app dev or for IoT or even web apps, whatever you want to do with the services. Um, I mean, that's the great thing about services. You can, they're very, very versatile. You can use them in a lot of different ways. And um, what's a little different about Dream Factory is, is that it automatically provides the services. So if you hook up a SQL database, for example, you'll get 45 different um, services that do all kinds of things you'd want to do with SQL. So it's got, um, you know, stored procedures, SQL views, uh, intelligent filters, objects and related objects, 
object ordering, object sorting, um, even the metadata functions for SQL. So you can add fields or remove tables and all of that. Um, and then you can customize all of those services. So it's got a back-end scripting engine. And um, another big part of it is uh, user management. So with Active Directory, you can bring in um, any number of users or you know, just have users sign up. And then it's got a role-based access control so that you can control which users see which objects and um, have access to the um, API. Well, that's one of the things that I was puzzled about when I was looking at this because I was looking through the documentation, I see things that look like raw SQL being handed through some sort of API. That's not the kind of a uh, endpoint that you would provide directly to a client, right? Oh, no, you can. So um, here's how it works. Um, <clears throat> say that you're on, uh, on an airplane and you single sign on into um, a Dream Factory backend, and then you have access to, you know, this table on one SQL database and this other table on another database, maybe access to a NoSQL collection, uh, access to certain file storage assets or other services. Mm -hmm. Then if you, if you lose your iPad, uh, then your administrator can turn off your account, but uh, there's no way that they can ever get access to the master credentials behind all of those different services. So through single sign-on, you get proxy access to an entire platform of services that's governed by role-based access control. So you only get access to the things that you would need to have access to. And um, to, to get to your question, one of the services that we support is SQL filters. So you can use filters, for example, you know, show me all the contacts for this account. That's an object and a related set of objects. And you mm -hmm. can do that with filters for date ranges or anything else. And it's um, built to be safe. So there's no um, uh, SQL injection attacks. Um, it decomposes and recomposes all of those strings to make them safe. So it really is a security minded product and the, the goal is to let you have single sign-on come in and then get role-based access control just to the assets that you want then to, you know, build your mobile app out of. Well, normally then, wouldn't I need to build a, a next, like this would be the middleware and I still need to build my application on top of this then? Yeah, that's absolutely correct. So there's not a client aspect to Dream Factory. What we do is we provide... Um, example apps for all of the modern frameworks for Angular, Angular 2, React, uh, iOS, Android, um, um, uh, Windows Phone, I'm sure I'm forgetting a few. And then you can use those as a starting point to call those back-end services. So um, that's neat. I mean, it's loosely coupled between the, the middleware and the front end. And so that front end application can be written in any environment and use the REST API. Okay, so going back, actually, the example I brought up at the beginning of the show, which I presume you're paying attention to a little bit there. Um, the yeah. um, so 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 my cruise client. I'm thinking particularly of this because I'm more familiar with what I want to get done there. We have a, a traditional, you know, round page. Um, you know, every time you press submit, it goes away and comes back. Uh, a, a traditional web app, and I'm trying to make it Ajaxy and probably use Angular actually. So I could I could initially while I'm developing expose all of my Postgres tables and run that directly from my Angular app, or do I need to lock it down before I even get there if I don't expose it to the world yet? Yeah, so that's a great question. So when you um, install Dream Factory on a, a server somewhere, uh, we have a single page app, which lets you administer the platform. And actually mm -hmm. that's, that single page app is written in uh, Angular. Oh. And and since you're an admin, you have kind of super privileges to the whole platform. And, but, but all that single page app is doing is just calling our own service platform to, you know, mm -hmm. to, config, to configure it. And so you would hook up your, your Postgres database and create a user role and then decide which tables you wanted to expose. And then you could choose whether you wanted individual users to sign up through single sign-on or whether you just wanted to expose those tables, you know, in general to anyone who came to the website. So you can either have a user-based approach or what um, we call, uh, you know, or a general access approach. It depends on what's appropriate for your use case. But then all of the, um, 
uh, credentials to your Postgres, the master credentials to your Postgres database would be securely cached on the middleware platform, mm, not okay. available, yeah, not available anywhere. And uh, then somebody could come in through single sign on and then get role based access to just the data that you've exposed. Does, does that make sense? Yeah, it sort of does. I, I, my follow on question to that then is that, okay, so right now we have a, a single user that the booking engine logs in as, which is booking user. And unfortunately, that means it's exposing the passwords to booking user to get all the way through to Postgres and has its own connection there. So you're saying that with uh, with Dream Factory, I, I would move that one level down where I, I'd give the actual credentials for Postgres's booking user only to the middleware. And then I would then just say, I am booking user from the front end. Is that closer to what I could do? Yeah, that's exactly right. So, so then each time, I'm not really that familiar with your app, but each time yeah. you wanted to sell your app or to give it to a new client, you could create a user in the Dream Factory admin for that person and give them the same role-based access to the app. Mm. And, you know, you could, some users could get more access, some users could get less access. Absolutely, the, the credentials to your Postgres database need to be securely stored on the middleware where nobody can find them under any circumstances. Um, but, but then as each user logs in, they could have access to the Postgres tables that you indicate, but also other services. So you could light up any other additional services that you need. And part of the service platform is um, there's also user login. So you can build the single sign-on uh, right into your app. And a matter of fact, our our Angular example app has a class that makes doing single sign-on of the user, you know, to get the session ID uh, very, very easy to do. Once you have that session ID, they have access to whatever backend assets you've configured. Does that make sense? Yeah. What yeah. was the motivation for the, for the project? So um, we, are, you know, kind of as a company have spent a lot of time uh, working with service-based applications that run on service platforms. And that's something I've been working on for almost 15 years. And uh, about five or six years ago, we noticed that not only were we rewriting a lot of the same code every time, but um, it was, there's really a lot in, involved in correctly building a service platform, a lot of art and practice about how to do role-based access, about how to make the services really easy for a developer to consume them and to use them. And so uh, we decided to build an open source project and that's exactly what we did. And we, you know, we released it on GitHub. We've got installers for uh, Bitnami as a partner, uh, an open source partner, and they've got installers for everything from AWS to Microsoft Azure to, um, you know, VMware, a whole bunch of different platforms are available. And so we've really tried to make it easy to install. But I think the, the thing that's really different about, I mean, there's, there's tools out there that help you quickly build services, and we're pretty good at that. And to do API management of services, and we're pretty good at that. But what's different about what we've done is we've really adopted a platform approach to REST APIs. And the idea is, is that, um, you simply identify the backend data sources that you're interested in, and then it instantly provides all of the APIs you need. And maybe it's only 90% of the APIs you need. You might have to build a couple of custom ones on our platform. Uh, that's pretty easy to do. We, we support a whole bunch of backend languages, including uh, JavaScript and Node.js and Python and PHP and whatever you want to use. But um, there really are some big advantages to to the platform approach, and it makes it a lot easier for developers. Cool. Uh, so if I have an existing uh, web application and with an existing database and I, I've written my own kind of uh, custom interaction or I'm using some some other um, libraries to, to access databases, how, how do I get started using uh, Dream Factory if I want to kind of plug Dream Factory into that um, that setup. So I'm not sure we would plug that well into that setup, but let me let me tell you how you might want to proceed. Um, if you install it on you know any stack, it it runs and scales just like a LAMP stack. I mean, if you think about it, a REST API backend is a lot like a simple website. 
It gets a request, it gives a response. Hits the, gets a request, hits the database, gives a response. So we've made this thing stateless and extremely scalable. You can put it behind load balancers, you can install it on any server. You can even install it on your desktop if you're just doing development work. And then the idea is, is that you put your database credentials into Dream Factory. You create a service that says, you know, my Postgres database, my Oracle database, MongoDB, uh, whatever whatever data source you're interested in, or or you can combine them, no problem. And um, you put the credentials to the database in, and then that REST API is automatically there for your use. And you can we we support Swagger. Uh, open API that and so you can you can go into the interactive documentation and immediately start seeing the requests and the responses from uh, all of your different calls. And so um, if you have other services from some other project or something else that you're using, then those are easy to onboard as well. And then those come under role based access control as well. Um, another example is if you have legacy soap, services. We have a SOAP converter so you can onboard those services as well. And so on a single pane of glass with a consistent role-based access control and user authentication model, um, you can expose and mobilize all of those different assets. And um, so does that make sense? Yeah, 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 that's clear. Um, as far as like using um, Dream Factory, is it is it something that users are able to host themselves or, or are they required to go through um, some like a like a, a hosted solution or, or are both options available for them? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, they, they are both available. And so what we've done is we've got a free dev and test system at um, www.dreamfactory.com that's hosted by Verizon. And you just go uh, sign up and you're using it, you know, within 30 seconds. And then you can start configuring and building and figuring out, you know, how, how to hook up all of your services. We don't recommend that for production. Um, so for production, you really need to either, you know, go to the GitHub repo or go to one of the Bitnami packages and install that on your cloud or server of choice. And um, it's also really easy to move your work between instances of Dream Factory. So the service API layer kind of acts as a virtualization layer for your app. So if you've written an app, even on our free hosted system, you can write it there. If you like it, you can package it up, install Dream Factory on your server and move your app there really, really easily. So it really prevents lock-in. Um, and that's another thing that, you know, we love about open source software. Um, you know, so if you think about it, the client application that you build can be swapped out because you know it's loosely coupled to the REST API. You can install the backend middleware on any platform or cloud or data center. Um, so there's no lock in there. There's kind of a horizontal transport available. And then on the back end, we normalize your databases. So if you start out on MySQL, you can move to Postgres or you can move to Oracle. And you know the 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 databases have different capabilities, they may have different schema but the API is exactly the same to them all. And so, you know, what client you use doesn't matter, what server doesn't matter, what database doesn't matter. It's a really a broad, horizontal, open system. That was actually my next question was like how easy it was if you start off on, on one database platform, um, how easy it was to kind of to, to swap them out um, as you're going along. And it sounds like it's, it's really easy um, from what you just said. Yeah. So what you can do is you can, you know, select your app, select your services that you want to package up, select your um, database schema that you want to package up, even your application file. So each application on Dream Factory is like a mini website. You've got a folder with five, you know, for HTML and CSS and probably a one, one page app, two page apps. I don't think you really want to necessarily build your website on Dream Factory, but um, then you can package those assets up and then, move them to any other instance running uh, the Dream Factory engine. Of course, I mean, you can move the database schema. We don't actually move the data because um, for dev test production, you don't normally want to use the data. So if you want to merge or, you know, uh, move data, then there's a lot of tools that do that in the SQL world. And, um, you know, you can, you can manage your databases 
uh, and your application deployment and all of that stuff in the manner that you are normally accustomed to. So one of the things I was wondering about, um, just kind of scanning through some of the features um, that Dream Factory has, one of the things that caught my eye was the ability, was the ability to, to uh, combine uh, databases. Um, yeah, could you speak to that a bit? Yeah, that that's really, uh, really nifty. It, we call it data mesh. Um, so one of the things you can do is, you know, using the, the filters, you could get, for example, an account and the related contacts that are, you know, children of the account um, in a kind of a parent-child SQL relationship. But sometimes you want to merge things that are on different databases entirely. And, um, you know, so for example, you might have email address on one system of record, but you might have username on another system of record, and there's no, um, you know, logical relationship between them, but you know that they are both in the form of an email address and that there's similar uh, accounts on each system. So with data mesh, what you can do is you can um, impose some virtual schema across the system that that tells the REST API that it's completely fine to uh, use those two fields as virtual foreign keys and merge those records. And really, uh, in just a few minutes, you 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 just you can program into the into the Dream Factory back end, you know, that this is actually related to that. And then though then that shows up as a relationship and it's a relationship across the databases and it will merge them. And you can even do it between SQL and NoSQL. Uh, it's really very powerful. And so what you get back at the client, for example, you might have an account and contacts and orders. You know, the orders are related to the same account or orders are related to contacts, depends on the schema. Um, and you get this JSON document, but then you can go in and you can edit the document and change data, add contacts, add orders, add children, add parents, uh, delete things, whatever you want to do, turn around and push that document back to the REST API, and Dream Factory will make all of those new relationships happen on the back end. So um, a pretty nifty way to work with, uh, you know, rich JSON documents in some, some of the more sophisticated uh, use cases. So you've made it so, I mean, if I'm, if I'm hearing this right, you've made it so not only the uh, pulling data out from, from databases and, and uh, like traditional databases and NoSQL databases using Dream Factory, you've made that agnostic, but you've also made actually getting data into those data sources agnostic as well. Yeah, ab absolutely. So, you know, using the REST API, you'll, you'll see the verbs come out, right? So, you know, get is going to get the record, put is going to replace the record, patch is going to update the record, delete's there. Um, and of course, you can control all of that, what the client has access to with the role-based access control. You might not want anyone to delete or, or whatever. But um, yeah, so it, it's a very powerful, you know, create, read, update, delete engine for um, uh, doing anything you want with backend data or services. Once you have an established setup, say like I had a, a setup where I had um, a Postgres database that stored um, some information, say like user accounts, and I had a MySQL database that had um, some additional information. If I wanted to add a third uh, source, data source, say like a MongoDB or or some some other NoSQL solution, how easy is it to update uh, a Dream Factory setup to to kind of slide that in? Um, do you mean to replace the Postgres with Mongo, or you know, to change whether you're using Mongo or you're using Postgres? If I wanted to have uh, start off with like two data sources and add a third, so then I had three data sources. Yeah, There's, that's really straightforward because each one of those different data sources or services is just a different branch on the REST tree on the request URL. So it'll be you know dub 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 my server slash uh, you know, REST slash API slash MongoDB or whatever you've named it, and then the table name or the, or the collection name, and then you can go from there. And then the other one would be, you know, slash my Postgres database or whatever you named it. So you can totally, uh, you know, use this, use that, and they're all coming from the same service platform, from the same um, coherent REST uh, API. And so, 
That's really important. I mean, one of the one of the big advantages of an API platform is that every time you build a new mobile app, it's got the same API. And, you know, this is something we've worked on for many years to try to figure out what's the best way to put APIs together and make them work together. So for example, um, the SQL API has more capabilities, but if you, if you get rid of the schema and the relationships, it's really the same as the NoSQL API. And then if you get rid of the filtered queries, it's really the same as the file API. So, you know, there's a lot of, um, you know, they're kind of subsets of each other. And, it, and once you get used to it, you, you can really get, a, you know, it's easy to read, write uh, any backend data source kind of using very similar methods. And so that was really one of the design goals for the project. Uh, I'm, uh, earlier you mentioned that the, we had, uh, you had like Python and JavaScript that you could plug in on the back end and provide some sort of scripting. What's the interface between that and the running, I guess it's a mini web server that you're running on the, on the, as, as the top of the platform. Is it, is it that now that, that code now has to provide a socket interface or are you running scripts and taking standard out and doing something like what, how, how does that work? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, you go to the admin interface of Dream Factory and you can see all of your different services that are available. And mm -hmm. then with the scripting engine, you can edit either the request or response of any service. And so um, it, it's, you know, it's just a little snippet of JavaScript. You can do all kinds of things. So for example, um, let's say if an account comes in that's you know, a big account, you might want to send an email. Um, or, you know, if um, you want, might want to do custom validation, you might want to say, you know, gosh, you know, I want to validate uh, that this looks like a social security number or an email address on the server side. Or you might want to um, ca perform a calculation when there's a response to the service. So you can heavily customize all of the, um, the services with these scripts and uh, for, for, you know, you can solve all kinds of different use cases, like you can um, do metering or alerts, or you can uh, merge data at that level, if that's what you, if, you know, you, the data merge feature isn't the way you want to do it. So, um, and then it, uh, it runs those, it runs that engine on the back, on the back end, on the server side, but you can edit and work on those scripts from the admin console because you're, you have admin credentials and can can do that at that point. Does that make sense? It's sort of uh, not, not quite getting to the uh, the cru uh, crust, uh, the crux of the question. <laughs> I'm thinking food already, <laughs> but the uh, um, what I'm thinking for again the, my cruise application. We've written a lot of business logic into uh, an ORM code, ORM adjacent code, uh, to talk to our Postgres database. And I'm wondering if there's any way I could get access to some of that through some sort of API interface to that. Yeah, abso absolutely. So one, this, hopefully the simple way to do it is you just go grab that code and paste it into the scripting window in the admin console. And mm -hmm. then, you know, it's, it's either going to be triggered on when it gets the API request for the data or it gets the API response for the data. What's nifty about it is you can use the same, uh, REST API calls that you use on the client on the server. So as a matter of fact, the, the, each role-based access control either gives you rights to do it, to expose it externally on the client or to actually do scripting on it on the server. So you could write a custom service that calls your SQL database if you needed to, if, mm -hmm. if the default service wasn't doing it for you. Or let's say your client wanted the data in a certain format then you know on the response you could reformat the data and send it down to the client like that. Um, so I think there there'd be a couple different ways for you to to leverage the work that you've already done and get the APIs to 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 be you know in the format that you wanted. Okay, uh, we have a question from the chat room here. Um, uh, so <laughs> Emily the Strange asks, uh, what separates this from the VMware thingy? She forgot the name, like VMware Orchestra. Um, I'm not familiar. I'm not familiar with that product. Um, okay. I, I, I can tell you what. Um, there's a lot of tools out there that help you either build or manage APIs, and Dream Factory is a little different in that we're really focused on providing an API platform, 
And l let me tell you why I think that's valuable. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what normally happens at a company is that somebody needs to mobilize some, uh, you know, they need to build a, an a, they need to build a mobile application. They design an API, they hook it up to a database. And then, you know, a couple months later, somebody needs to build another mobile application. And, you know, they, the first one's in production, and the, the, the new one has different requirements. They build another API. And then uh, consultants come in and they build a mobile application. And pretty soon you end up with, you know, backend infrastructure that's enormously complex, can't be ported, scaled, it's not reliable, and it's not secure because each one of these mobile applications is another attack vector. It's another external endpoint that can be attacked. So what's, what you really need to do is not that, but rather um, look at the backend data sources that you want to mobilize and create a single coherent platform for general purpose application development. Then you can build all of your apps on that platform. And, and you, it keeps the APIs consolidated, standardized, provides compliance, provides governance. Um, it's really a, mu you know, a much better way to do things. And if you think about it, this is how things always work. I mean, think about building a Microsoft Windows desktop application. You know, think how crazy the world would be if you had to design the APIs you needed send them off to Microsoft, get Microsoft to build them, and then send them back to you with the next Windows update. It would take forever, and it would Windows would end up being a bloated, insecure mess. So, you know, that doesn't, that doesn't happen because Microsoft has a platform, and the, the platform provides everything you need to build applications. And, you know, you don't have to, you know, you don't have to contact Microsoft to build a Windows application. So what we've tried to do is to do that for APIs. And um, I think that's what's really unique about us. And so like, I'm not familiar with the VMware uh, product she's, she's talking about, but um, uh, you know, that's where we're coming from. Awesome. Hey, that's a, that was a great analogy. I really like that. That basically you're you're Windowsizing everything. Well, that that's probably the wrong way to say it. But whatever. <laughs> I think I got the sense of where you're trying to get with that. That that we we code to standards and uh, we don't have to keep adding new standards every time we want to uh, uh, do a little bit more with our stuff. Hey, uh, uh, whether you're developing an app, a website, or working on a server-based project, you need flexible, reliable, and affordable hosting. DigitalOcean offers droplets, which are virtual private servers that can be customized and deployed easily to host websites, web apps, production applications, personal projects, virtual desktops, and almost anything else you can think of with full root access. This helps you get your project off the ground quickly and makes it easy to scale when you find success. DigitalOcean is used by over 600,000 developers, including me. I first found out about DigitalOcean last year's scale, and I heard that they've got FreeBSD, and I went, all right, finally, a cloud provider that gets me, okay? Deploy and configure your droplets via streamlined control panel or simple API. You could choose your OS, Ubuntu, CentOS, Debian, Fedora, CoreOS, and FreeBSD. Select from one of the many pre-configured one-clicks like Drupal, Docker, or Node.js to get up and running quickly. Or build the exact infrastructure you need with root access to servers running 100% SSDs and state-of-the-art data centers around the world. It's highly scalable to meet the demands of a rapidly growing application or business. You can also use the advanced features like floating IPs for high availability, private networking, and automated deployments via API. There's an extremely active community with a large and detailed set of tutorials on the ways you can use your droplet. Want to configure a LAMP server? Set up a virtual desktop or VPN? They got you covered. And it's so easy to get started. You can deploy an SSD cloud server in as little as 55 seconds. DigitalOcean is incredibly affordable and straightforward pricing. Servers start at only $5 a month. There's also hourly pricing available starting at less than a penny per hour. But we're going to make it so that you can get started today and deploy an SSD cloud server for free. Visit digitalocean.com and create an account. Once you confirm your email and account information, go to the billing section and enter the promo code FLOSS for a free $10 credit. That's plenty to get started and explore what DigitalOcean can do. That's digitalocean.com. And once you sign up, enter the code FLOSS in the billing section to get your $10 credit for free. We thank DigitalOcean for their support of FLOSS Weekly. And then, Gareth, you had a question? Uh, yeah, so one of the so things that I was... I was reading through the uh, the Dream Factory website uh, again, like the features um, just caught my eye. Uh, was was centered around logging um, and and reporting and uh, monitoring. I'm, I'm pretty sure I saw. Uh, so one of the things that that I started wondering is uh, 
how does how does Dream Factory handle a situation where, uh, say, you have like some configured database sources, and one of those database sources, one of those database sources, just goes away? Um, is there any sort of logic to handle that situation? You mean when it it goes down? Uh, yeah, if if a database server just like goes away, or you have it hosted in a a, a cloud provider, um, and the, the instance just disappears for s some unknown reason. Yeah. Uh, how does how does cloud or how does uh, Dream Factory handle that situation? So the the service API is going to give you is going to start returning errors on that database, and it will you know it'll it'll give you some illustrative error that it can't can't connect. Um, but there's any of the conventional tools you use for monitoring databases or servers are work fine with Dream Factory. And most of them have a service interface. Matter of fact, you could onboard the service to Dream Factory and provide that as part of the application environment. So, um, you know, potentially you could even get more additional information about a database that's down. But we don't really have a special uh, capability to handle that. Is there any sort of um, uh, caching or, or mechanisms in place to, not, not specifically for like if a database server goes down, but uh, so you're not constantly hammering a database, um, getting the same information over and over again. Yeah, absolutely. So we definitely support, you know, database caching. And uh, I think, you know, you can install what it, the cache of your choice. Redis is a really nice one. And um, so it, you know, absolutely will, uh, you know, handle, you know, massive transactions uh, without hammering the database. Um, another place we use the cache that's pretty neat is that if you have an external service that you've written, then uh, you can also cache those results. So, for example, let's say you had a stock ticker, then you could set the cache to be, you know, a 30-second time to live, and then, uh, you know, every, it would only get a new uh, uh, stock value for a given symbol, you know, every 30 seconds or whatever the time was that you wanted. So um, I think that's a big part of it is, um, you know, people need performance and you think about um, mobile applications that are you know massive mobile and also IOT is another case where uh, Internet of Things where um, you know these deployments are potentially gigantic and so you, ne you need to be able to support that uh, one one thing we've worked on is um, JSON web tokens which are really cool technology if you haven't haven't looked into that um, but they're completely stateless so it really simplifies, you know, putting instances behind a load bal balancer, or if you look at um, uh, Docker with, you know, Kubernetes or Swarm or any of these new uh, deployment technologies on Docker, um, you can just, you know, adjust however many instances you want to run. One of the instances goes down, it'll restart it, all of that type of thing. Um, another example is the platform as a service systems like, uh, you know, Bluemix or OpenShift. And they're, they're similar in that you can have any number of kind of horizontal instances to handle uh, scalability. So one of the things you just mentioned actually leads me to, to a, a, the next question I was going to ask um, is the Internet of Things. Um, it, we've seen like that, that's just like a market that's blown up the last couple of years. Um, how, does, how does Dream Factory relate to that, and what what do you what do you think in general of of the Internet of Things uh, kind of movement? Yeah, it's fascinating, isn't it? I mean, there's a lot more things than people, and uh, you, know, you kind of see where this is headed. Um, everything's going to have an IP address, I guess, and uh, be managed. I think I think there's you know there's different. We have a lot of people using Dream Factory for in Internet of Things. There's different categories of use. Um, you know, the, the consumer things like watches and so forth, we don't have much to do with that. That's probably Bluetooth. It's probably not even a REST API. Um, but there's a whole bunch of other things like the industrial Internet of Things, I IoT, where there are very practical solutions for, you know, building HVAC or connected cars or, um, you know, all kinds of different power systems. And uh, so that's going to be a big market. And that's kind of an enterprise market. Where we fit in is that, um, you know, these devices usually stream data to a central router or to something like that. And uh, then the, the router is going to push that data into the cloud. And a lot of times, you know, people need a system that can be installed on any server, connect to any database, 
and provide a really easy to use back end for you know, pushing any data that you want into the cloud, then you can turn around and build mobile apps that control the devices on top of the platform. So that's where a number of people have been um, using us so far. And it, it is going to be interesting to see how all of that develops. It's certainly up and coming. And so uh, what's the, uh, you have, uh, from, what I, from the, seeing the website, you have like an enterprise version and an open source version. What license is the open source version in? It's, it's on Apache. Okay. And uh, yeah, so it's it's very um, very you know it's not a viral license or anything like that. You can use this any way you want. Um, all of the open source uh, databases and you know other things like Mongo or Postgres or MySQL, that's all free and included with the open source product. So if you're you know a developer building a greenfield application, um, you know come join the crowd, we've got a community forum, we've got documentation, um, you know, that's, it's a, a, developers love it. We've had about 100,000 admins sign up so far, and there's even more developers and even more end users. Um, mm. And then the, the enterprise product includes uh, more of the things that you'd want to do if you were an enterprise developer. So, you know, uh, or, you know the proprietary da databases like Oracle and SQL Server, and the uh, proprietary systems like Active Directory and that type of thing. So that's some additional components plus uh, development and production support for um, enterprise deployment. And you said it was really they would run on a LAMP stack. What's the, or similar LAMP stack, what, what are your actual technologies that you need in order to support this? Like if I wanted to do it on FreeBSD, I'd have to have all the right pieces, I presume. So what, what kinds of things would I need to have? Yeah, so you need Apache or Nginx web server, um, mm -hmm. PHP 5.6. Uh, we also install the V8 engine for scripting. That's Google's uh, backend uh, engine that runs JavaScript. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, then the Dream Factory source code, pull it off of GitHub and you're good to go. Okay, so that sounds reasonably easy to port to FreeBSD then because that's my preferred platform as you, as you heard during the ad. Um, and what's on the roadmap? Where, where are you headed? And where, what are you still missing the most that you want maybe people to come along and help you build? Yeah, absolutely. So we, we have a great community and a lot of people are helping us, uh, you know, build all kinds of different aspects of the project. Um, you know, especially some of the more advanced databases like Cassandra and things like that that we haven't really gotten to yet. Um, and uh, where, where we're going, the, the new thing we're getting ready to uh, really announce and really start pushing is not just API automation, where you can hook up a database and get all the services that you need, but um, really instant developer portals to where a modern developer can come in, hit the portal, choose what type of package they want, and mm -hmm. then get all of the services that they need. So, you know, they, if, you know, things like Stripe and Twilio and, you know, legacy SOAP services, whatever their IT department or their partner or anyone decides that they need, all of the services will be available, plus the database capabilities as well. And so our, our thinking is, you know, this is really the next step in instant API automation platforms where, um, you know, we want to make it as easy as possible for modern developers to, um, to, to build the appropriate app that they want to build and for big companies to uh, make it so that their, their front end developers are not entangled with back end IT. That's mm -hmm. where you save all the money. Cause you know, when, when back end IT and front end starts to play the match of API ping pong, that's what gets really, really expensive. That's where more than half the money can end up being spent. So we, what we want is a loosely coupled environment where the back end administers the platform, sets up the role-based access and security, and then on the front end, developers can come in and use that platform to build whatever type of mobile apps they want to build. And I, I really, you know, that's kind of our vision for the future. Cool, and uh, you keep saying role-based uh, uh, rules. Uh, are they the union of, of membership groups and is there a hierarchy to it? Yeah, so w what we mean by role-based access is you can decide which uh, databases and tables and fields and services and restful verbs and everything that it's okay for somebody to use. And so when, you know, John or Bob logs in, 
They get assigned the proper role for them, uh, maybe by Active Directory or maybe just by our own role system. And then they have access to just the data that they need. Um, and then, you know, like, like I said, if they, if they leave their phone on an airplane, their administrator can turn off, you know, can deactivate their account and all of that access is gone. Okay, and uh, we're almost out of time, which really makes me sad. I think we can talk about this for another hour easily. There's so much more to cover in this thing. So, uh, But uh, I do want to ask, is there anything we didn't cover that you want to make sure our audience is aware of? Uh, no, just um, just to reiterate, though, you know, Dream Factory is an open source project. It's available on GitHub. Um, and you know, on our website, there's installers through Bitnami for a whole bunch of different cloud platforms. We also have a free dev and test system on our website. You can sign up and try it there uh, before you uh, burn a server on uh, on it. And uh, there's a community forum. Come come participate. We'd love to have you. Cool. And uh, is there a quick magic trick you could do? Uh, <laughs> don't have much. I have a deck of cards here. Right. So I'm having trouble with the <laughs> here. Uh, let's see. For your I'm face. having trouble with my camera. <laughs> yeah, I should say that. Okay. Deck so, of that's about that's it. Pretty, that's pretty cool. <laughs> One so, of those was my card. How did you do that? <laughs> sure, sure, turns out studying magic is uh, great preparation for being a Silicon Valley CEO. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. So uh, two last questions that my audience will demand if I don't, if I forget to ask it. Uh, what's your favorite scripting language? Uh, I think JavaScript is hard to beat. I, you know, it, it yeah. seems pretty straightforward. Okay. And your favorite text editor? Oh gosh. I use text wrangler on the Mac, but I'm, I'm, that's probably not the best. Oh, uh, it's something though. And at least you said on the Mac, that's cool. Cause I'm a Mac user too. And it gets all my people who are uh, open source only mad every time I say that, but that's too bad. I like <laughs> my Mac. I like my iPhone. I'm not switching, guys. No matter how many times you write it and say, Randall, you're you're being, uh, uh, what do they call it, uh, un, untrue, unfair. Uh, uh, I don't know. Anyway, like that. But, Bill, uh, there's just so much more we could have covered, and I really appreciate you taking the time to at least give people a sense of where this is and where it's going and maybe the problems it can solve. And I, I know I'm going to look for look at this stuff for both of my current clients, so uh, this uh, seems really important. Thanks for coming on the show. Th thank you very much. And if you have any trouble with your project, just get in touch with support. Okay, awesome. That was Bill Appleton talking to us about this really, really wonderful thing called Dream Factory, which now I sort of get what the reference for the name is because it's how you can build dreams. Gareth, what do you think? Uh, it definitely sounds interesting. Um, I, I'm curious to see uh, how where they go in the future and, and just to hear about how people start using it. Um, it sounds like they're, they're taking... Um, they're they're making it a lot easier to, for everyone to use um, and expose their APIs. So definitely an interesting project. Yep, and certainly timely too, because I know that as we start moving legacy uh, database installations and uh, trying to combine that with NoSQL, trying to combine that with maybe file-based data, this looks like a great way to give us everything we need for all those mobile apps and uh, and security apps, things like that. So I am looking forward to learning more about this. Of course, I say that with almost every project I bring on here because I have so many cool projects. But anyway, I'll try to do that with those for sure, especially if my, my at least my cruise client wants me to uh, take a stronger look at doing some cool things using uh, Ajax -E calls. Okay, so what's coming up is we got data stacks next week. That's a Cassandra NoSQL uh, stack, although with a lot more stuff added to it. So it's uh, all about dealing with big data. We have Biturgia, which is a software development analytics. So you hook it up to your bug tracking systems and things to figure out just how fast your project's actually moving through the uh, through troubles and through new features. We have Lisk, which is a JavaScript-based uh, sidechain blockchain app in the cloud. That sounds like a lot of fun. Uh, Aurelia, which is JavaScript reactive framework from a formula Angular guy. So this is uh, somebody who wasn't uh, satisfied with the progress and the direction that Angular was going in. So he created his own little project that uh, simplifies some things, makes certain things easier to do. Uh, Koha ILS, which is a library information system. They claim they're the first, but I think the Evergreen people might have a claim to that too if they're still around. So we'll compare uh, Koha and Evergreen when we bring them on. Lucidworks, Luc oh, sorry, Lucidworks 
uh, it's about searching, searching all the data you have, searching all the, the, the uh, all your repositories, all your access and stuff, and about providing that as exposed to uh, people who are coming along to your site. Karina, which promises to be an easy to use, instant on native container environment, and it comes from Rackspace, just added to the schedule. Uh, I've been in touch with the Capital One open source uh, project, and we'll have somebody from open uh, from Capital One, and I. Uh, there's a few frameworks and stuff that they have already, so we'll bring them on to talk about that. Uh, Cluster HQ uh, projects also just signed on. Uh, I forgot to write down what it is, but it's something about uh, uh, distributed file systems, things like that, as I recall. Uh, GitLab was supposed to be today, but uh, we ended up uh, moving him down later because he had to make a last-minute cancellation. Uh, date's not exactly confirmed, but somewhere out in there. Those are everybody that's actually booked, but if you want other people to be booked, the way to do that is to go to the big spreadsheet at twit.tv slash floss, See if it's already somebody I'm trying to work with, or if, you, if, it's, if the name is not there, then email the project leader or the community coordinator and have them email me. My address right there is Merlin at Stoneninch.com, and that's how they get on this list. Uh, we're opening up Q3 a little bit at a time to make sure that the show stays close as possible clustered. We have a live stream we took a couple questions from uh, at uh, twi live.twit.tv. It uh, normally tapes at 9.30 a.m. Pacific time on Tuesdays. You can follow us at Floss Weekly on Google+, and at Floss Weekly on Twitter. You can follow me at Randall L. Schwartz on Floss, uh, Floss Weekly, no. <laughs> Randall L. Schwartz on Google+, Plus or at Merlin on on Twitter. Uh, I'm upcoming. This is uh, conference season, so I'm going to be at Yap CNA, uh, which now renamed back again the Pearl Conference, coming up in a couple weeks. Uh, going to uh, Red Hat Summit, which is in downtown San Francisco. So I'll be in San Francisco for the first time in a couple of years, which is really nice. Uh, the Texas Linux Fest, which is in Austin again. So I'll be back in Austin near that dangerous sidewalk that made me have a black eye. But that's a long story. I am not going to Fisley in Puerto Alegre, Brazil, because I'm concerned that I'll be a vector for the Zika virus. So out of respect for all of my friends and all the places I travel to, I am not going there this year. I'll probably get picked up again next year. And DragonCon coming up in September in uh, Hotlanta. And uh, I'll be a, a four projects on the EFF track. And I'm supposed to also get one or two slots on the podcasting track. So watch for me there if you're there. That's all my plugs. How about you, Gareth? Um, Mine are simple and short, no, nowhere near compared to the number of plugs you have, um, yep. but that's okay. Uh, I'll be at uh, a DevOps Day uh, Silicon Valley in uh, June 24th and 25th uh, in San Francisco. So if you're over there, go say hi to Garrett. That's pretty cool. And if you see me at any of these conferences or just walking around the, wandering around the streets of Santa Monica, please say hi. Uh, I'm a friendly guy. I tend not to bark too loudly. So uh, real cool. So, uh, wow, what a show. Glad I got us on in the last second there, uh, and uh, I learned a lot, and I now know I have a lot more I need to learn, so that's how it's going to go. But again, thank you, Gareth, for stepping in at the last minute as well. Yeah, always glad to do it. Uh, glad we were able to pull off the show at the last minute. Really, cool, cool. And uh, we'll see you all again next week on Floss Weekly. Floss Weekly.